Hello, everybody. Happy holidays from Envision Blockchain. We're so happy that you can watch this with us. Today, we're going to be talking about blockchain terminology and standards. So if this is your first time taking a look at Envision Blockchain Solutions, thank you so much. Uh, if I can just give you five seconds and explain who it is and what we are. So Envision Blockchain Solutions is a Microsoft partner. We're focused on blockchain agnostic solutions for today's business needs. We have a mission and a vision to increase blockchain adoption and drive organizational transformation. We consider ourselves a full consultancy uh, professional services blockchain firm because we really like to help out organizations at every different level of their uh, blockchain maturity, if you will, or maybe different milestones within their blockchain journey. So we have different offerings uh, to, to help out with whichever area that you're currently in. So for example, if you're just looking at the very beginning, say assessment phase, right? We have these offers for a half day blockchain immersion lab to really give you a hands-on experience and demos of what these different smart contracts are, um, what it is that they could do for you, how it is that they fit within the Microsoft Azure platform, so on and so forth. Uh, they really aim to drive and find this aha moment. Um, Further along the path, you may be looking at a use case workshop. So you understand that there's benefits of implementing blockchain technology. However, you may or may not know what exactly is the right business process to implement blockchain technology. So that's where you're gonna find a lot of the benefits from these use case workshops. So at the same time, you may already have a defined business case a use case as well. And now you need to develop either a proof of concept or an isolated pilot, or maybe you're ready to go ahead and develop out a production level environment. So that's where we can help out with the solution deployments as well. Uh, we also provide training and managed services to help support that implementation of that blockchain solution. So when you're taking a look at where blockchain really makes sense, and we spoke about this in some of the other presentations that we've done, you're gonna see that this really adds on to different IT services. So integrating blockchain solutions to different line of business applications is where you're gonna find a lot of value from integrating different systems. We help out with that as well, and also big data and reporting. So not to spend too much time on this slide, just to let you know about some of the areas that we like to focus on, uh, and what really stands us out from some of the other organizations out in this industry. We are uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance members, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, we are also Linux Foundation certified blockchain for business. Those are the folks that host the Hyperledger projects. Uh, we'll be talking more about the Hyperledger project fabric to be more specific. Uh, we're also Corda certified. Corda is a blockchain network that we're not gonna touch upon on this particular webinar. However, uh, we do realize the value that Corda can bring to the enterprise blockchain world. And uh, we're certified in that as well. And uh, we provide a staff of Microsoft certified professionals all across application development, data platform, data analytics, uh, you know, ISV vendors to help build SaaS models, and as well as uh, windows and devices, that's where you're gonna find a lot of the IoT um, sensors and so forth. So um, we're gonna get on to the meat and potatoes of this, uh, uh, of this presentation. And uh, the, the, the whole purpose is we're talking about industry standards and terminology, right? And this is why terminology is so important. Remember the play back when we were talking about who's on first, the Costello play? And uh, if I could just read this off. So, you know, I just want to know what's the name of the player on first base? No. What plays on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. How did I get to third? You said his name. If I said the third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's on first? What? What's on second? I don't know. He's on third. 
there I go back to third base. And, and I just love that play because that's where we really start to understand the naming conventions and what we're talking about. And it's really important that when we're in this new emerging technology that we have an opportunity to really talk about terminology and standards. So when we're talking about smart contracts, we all know what smart contracts are. If you don't know what smart contracts are, you're definitely in the right place because we're going to be talking about that. So if we think about why terminology and standards are so important, essentially businesses are looking to commercialize emerging technologies. And uh, that's part of the developing business ecosystem, right? And the stronger that you can exploit the networks within the ecosystem, the, father, the faster the market for their products will grow, right? So it's important that sometimes when things get complex, that there's certain obstacles that could rise up. And in order to overcome these obstacles and these barriers, uh, we're going to have to have some sort of terminology and standards in place so we can understand the rules of the game and we can know exactly how we can, we can use this, right? So it's important that we all get on the same page. We have to be able to have these terminology and these standards across the board so that we know how to commercialize our efforts. And now that we are speaking on the same terminology and standards, we have an opportunity to provide interoperability. And also it's important that standards, uh, when they're put in place, they can also streamline the development of these new technologies and all the related products. And then, you know, through these processes and systems, uh, this is how we can get more work done and be more efficient. And really, by doing all of this, we're really contributing to the innovation. And, uh, you know, it's important when we're innovating to take something from just an idea and really putting it into action. And that's where the collective business ecosystem that I'm going to present over the next few slides, um, this is where that it's really important, right? So we all need to get on the same page. And by, by doing that, by having these groups that I'm going to touch upon, by having these projects, by having some of these uh, frameworks, I'm going to mention these blockchain frameworks that they're going to be open source, right? Uh, it really helps out in having the community contribute to the overall project. And then the more that these terminologies and these standards become, I mean, I don't know if we want to call them a household name, but if you're involved with business processes, if you're involved in innovation, if you're involved in technology, if you're involved in business and you want to understand where should we go next, and we're talking specifically, you know, in the enterprise world, then getting on the same page with this blockchain terminology, it's going to be so critical. So, um, Again, this is, this is something that we're going to be taking a stab at because at this early state of this blockchain industry that we're at, standards aren't really there. And the terminology is still, right, if you put in a search on the web for what does this mean or what does that mean, I mean, you're going to find different things in different forums. You're going to find, uh, you know, uh, posts, social media posts about different topics, but we're all trying to say the same thing. So again, over the next few slides, I'm going to touch on a couple uh, blockchain frameworks that we're going to touch upon, right? So, so these are blockchain frameworks. We're going to cover Ethereum. We're going to cover Hyperledger Fabric, and there's so many more. For example, I mentioned Corda earlier, and there's Quorum, which is essentially a deviation or a fork, as they say, of Ethereum. Uh, we're not going to touch upon these. We're going to try to keep it as simple as we can and try to try to talk about these two blockchain frameworks. Okay. Um, what I'm going to present over here, uh, you can very easily do a search for read the docs. Okay. If you do a search for Ethereum, read the docs and Hyperledger, read the docs and go to the glossary section. That's where I took a lot of the material for this presentation. And then I provided some, you know, discussion around that and some screenshots around what, what those different uh, terminology points and, and standardization points mean. 
but essentially, right, everything that we're talking about in this presentation, you can go back and do your own research and, uh, you know, dive deeper into some of these uh, um, presentation topics. So something else that I would like to mention before I get too deep into this presentation, it's uh, we're, we're keeping it simple, but at the same time, we're going to go over these at a super high level. So for a deeper insight, we provide, as I mentioned earlier, this enterprise blockchain immersion half day workshop. We really encourage everyone to go and check this out. This is listed in the Azure marketplace. It is free. So it is a free half day session. It really provokes the forward thinking, which results in questions that really helps our clients. And it will definitely help you in finding this aha moment so that you know what you're seeking when you're looking at this blockchain industry and how blockchain could help out your organization. So we provide education. So understanding the concepts that we're going to be talking about in this presentation, we're going to take it deeper as well. And also what Microsoft is doing with the blockchain space. I think that's important to understand because they provide a lot of, um, a lot of benefits as they are, you know, as Microsoft Azure is one of the largest, largest cloud provider over there with 54 regions across the globe um, it's really interesting to see what Microsoft is doing to drive blockchain adoption along you know along the same lines with what Envision blockchain is looking to do uh, but then there's this immersion section so here in this presentation I'm just basically gonna glaze over some of these points when we're doing this immersion we're gonna actually put you in front of these uh, smart contracts these programs that I'm going to talk about they're all going to be moving everything is going to be working we have a ton of proof of concepts to share with you and uh, you know we we allocate some time to really talk about your business processes and how it's all going to mix and mingle so again we're not going to get incredibly deep with this presentation but we are going to glaze over a ton of different topics. So, all right, let's get right into it. So first we're gonna cover Ethereum. So what is Ethereum? At the very high level, at the very beginning, Ethereum is an open blockchain platform. It lets anyone build and use decentralized applications that run on blockchain technology. Probably heard of Bitcoin. So like Bitcoin, no one controls or owns Ethereum. Again, it's an open source project built by many people across the world. So we're going to make a clear distinction over the next couple of slides. Most likely when you're reading this, you're thinking of Ethereum. We just said Bitcoin. You're thinking cryptocurrency and that is true, but that's not the only truth to it, right? So there's going to be another element of enterprise Ethereum that I'm going to show you. So... First, what I just mentioned earlier on the previous slide. So there's the public Ethereum network. Again, I'm going to talk about Ethereum and we're gonna talk about Hyperledger Fabric as it relates to the terminology within these particular sections, right? We have these two sections. So here's all the terminology that's going to be with Ethereum, right? So you're gonna see this, if you're talking about Ethereum, you're gonna see this terminology over the next couple slides. So there's public Ethereum network. Right now, at this, current, at this current moment, at the end of December, this is a live view of all the nodes in the public Ethereum network. And right now we have 10,777 nodes live in the public Ethereum network. And I think that that's really, really interesting to note, right? So what is this public Ethereum network? Public Ethereum network means anyone has permission Everyone has permission to get into this public Ethereum network. We can also say that this is a permissionless network because anyone can go ahead, go online, download one of their nodes. And as long as you have connectivity, you can connect to the network, which is great because, you know, how many, how many of us could say that we belong or that we operate business or we are, 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 are doing something transacting where there's 10,777 peers, right? We talk about a distributed decentralized network. I mean, this is, this is as decentralized as you can get right here. So I think that this is really, really important to note 
because while we have the public Ethereum network, again, this runs on that cryptocurrency Ethereum, or you might have heard Ether, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. In order for you to do anything on this public Ethereum network, you need to have that cryptocurrency in a wallet. If you don't know what wallet means, we're going to cover that too over the next couple slides. So while we have the public Ethereum network, we also have a private Ethereum network. The private Ethereum network is something really interesting when we're talking about enterprise blockchain adoption. So the private Ethereum network is great because you don't need Ethereum in order to transact over this network. So there are no transaction fees. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. But what the screenshot is basically showing is that this is one direction that Microsoft Azure decided to take in helping enterprise blockchain adoption. So you can go sign up for an account for free on Microsoft Azure if you don't have that already, or maybe you're part of an organization and Microsoft Azure consumption is part of your enterprise agreement or EA for short right? You can go and you leverage this cloud computing giant to go and launch nodes within your particular business process, if you will, within your business network. And this is what we mean when we talk about a permissioned ledger, right? So before we talk about the public and that was permissionless, this is permissioned. So anybody, if they want to operate on this network, they're gonna need permission in, right? So just want to highlight this right here, Microsoft Azure. If you go to the blockchain section, you can go launch an Ethereum proof of authority consortium like right now. The deployment process is fairly quick and you can see that Ethereum proof of authority consortium is what we highlighted. And if you're questioning what proof of authority is, I'm really glad that you're paying attention. We're gonna talk about that in a couple slides next. But let's focus on this term called consortium. So what is a consortium? This is something else that you're going to hear within the blockchain industry. And specifically right now we're talking about Ethereum. So Ethereum, this private blockchain consortium, allows this shared ledger. And this is something that we can spend an entire, entire session on. We can spend an entire day, a whole week, talking about how different businesses can benefit from sharing a, a ledger. You're going to also come across the term of DAP, Decentralized Application. And a DAP is a service that enables a direct interaction between the end user and providers. I mean, very simply put, this is the application that you could use for whatever application that you're looking to do, and this transacts across the blockchain. So moving along, you're also going to hear terms like wallet and address. And this is, this is a fairly simple concept. So an Ethereum address represents an account. The account usually starts with a 0x. So if you see over here uh, what it is that we're looking at, this is a MetaMask wallet that you can create for free. It's a, it's a Google Chrome extension that you can install. Um, and very simply, you can use this to, to uh, uh, create an account so that you can interact across different Ethereum networks. You can interact off of the public network, what we showed you earlier, or at the same time, you can also connect it to a private network, like what we were just talking about with what Microsoft Azure is doing. And when you launch your Ethereum private network, and you want to make transactions off of that, remember the dApps that we just explained, and you want to use the dApps to, to make certain transactions happen, well, you can go ahead and create a MetaMask wallet. It'll automatically generate an address for you, and that is the address, or AKA, that is your account. So, of course, in blockchain, you're going to hear about blockchains, and you're going to hear about blocks, and you're going to hear about ledgers. So essentially, a blockchain 
a block and a ledger, depending on who you're talking to, could have similar meanings, right? Depending on what it is that we're talking about, and I'm, I'm gonna explain that in the next couple slides, how it is that a ledger could be different from a blockchain. But essentially, a blockchain is a sequential stacking, if you will, of blocks that happen. And, and a block is a package of data, but it doesn't need to contain data in order to, 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 uh, uh, to lock everything in. So a block is a package of data that contains zero or more transactions. And the hash that we're gonna talk about, the hash of the previous block is also included in this, in this block. So again, that the blockchain, as you could see, that they're sequentially numbered. It goes from 50 to 51 to 52 to 53 to 54 to 55, right? And in order to make a transaction, we just spoke about transactions. In order to make a transaction, you're going to need to have either ether, right? And ether is essentially what you need is gas. So Ether is the name of the currency used within Ethereum. You use Ethereum for computations or transactions on this Ethereum virtual machine. And essentially gas is the name for the crypto fuel, if you will, is the name for the Ether that's consumed when the code is executed, when the smart contract is executed. We'll talk about that. And the gas is paid for as an execution fee for every operation made on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, you can really think about it simply that the amount of ether used is called the gas. And then you also have a gas limit, which is kind of interesting when we think about it. So for individual transactions, the gas limit represents the maximum amount of gas or ether that you indicate you're willing to pay for a contract execution transaction. Um, what it was really designed for, it's really meant to protect the users from getting their ether depleted when trying to execute something buggy, right? Or maybe some kind of malicious contracts. That the block gas limit represents the maximum cumulative gas used for the transactions of a block. What's even more interesting to note is that when we talk about ether and gas and gas limit, remember I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we're talking about the differences between the public blockchain network and the private blockchain network. So in the public blockchain network, this is where we really have this, you need ether, the cryptocurrency, you need to purchase the ether in order to have the ether in hand for that, for, for, uh, for the transaction to go because it requires that ether as gas. In the enterprise blockchain version, the private blockchain consortium that we showcased earlier in Microsoft Azure, you don't need ether in order to make the transactions happen, but you still have to set the gas limit because there still is gas. What we're showing you is a, is a screen that is the blockchain explorer which is a way for you to look at the blockchain, interact with it from a user interface perspective. And you could see that this, uh, that, that this was off of a private network. And while we made a transaction, while we used gas, we didn't need Ethereum in order to make this happen. Something important to note. So just like we talked about blocks and blocks contain different transactions. The block is essentially a collection of all the transactions that happen. It's important just to showcase how these transactions look like when you're looking at the block explorer. Uh, the transaction is a signed data package that stores a message to be sent from one to another. So again, it's important to think of the transaction that contains data of a message. When we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the public blockchain network, a transaction is I have some coins, cryptocurrency, that I'm sending to this individual or to this wallet that now we know what a wallet and address is. I'm sending this 
amount of cryptocurrency to the address that's part of this wallet, right? That's the, the amount of coins and from who to who, that's all part of the transaction data. In the, in the private blockchain, it could be, I have this asset and I'm gonna be uh, pushing this asset to this particular person. Or maybe I've just digitally signed this document and now I'm, now I'm transacting that digital signing of it. Right. So these are all different things that we can that we can think about on what does it mean a transaction and what kind of data stores within this transaction. Some of these next slides are going to kind of help out with that. So um, with blockchain, with Ethereum, with Hyperledger, we're going to talk about it's very hard to have this conversation without smart contracts because smart contracts, essentially, we're going to keep it simple for this presentation. The smart contract is a program. That's it. It's like an app. It's, a app. it's an application. It's a program. It's a smart contract that you use. Um, and it has this uh, set of data and executable functions. And these functions execute when Ethereum transactions are made within certain parameters. And, um, you know, if we're, if we're taking a look at this, uh, this screenshot right here, and, and, and it's important to note, so this smart contract in Ethereum is developed within the language Solidity. I know that there's a couple other ones, but Solidity is one of the main uh, programming languages for Ethereum. And uh, this, if I were to call out one particular line, we could take a look at line 26 over here. And line 26 uh, talks about the, the state type, the enum state type. And, and, and I'm not gonna get into what the enum state type is in this particular presentation. But I think it's important to note one fact. A smart contract is essentially a codified way that you describe business logic. So. When this happens, then this happens, and then this happens, and then that happens based on certain parameters. So in line 26, what I was just mentioning, we have this enum state type, and you can start to see how smart contracts kind of carry business language, how they have business process in mind. So we have active and offer placed and pending inspection and inspected, appraised, notional acceptance, buyer acceptance, seller accepted, right? So some of these terms that I'm talking about, we're going to start to think about, oh, it's probably, it's probably a program for, for uh, real estate, right? So when we take a look at the next, uh, the next slide right here, so this is something that we, we, uh, we took this picture from the Microsoft Azure Blockchain GitHub repository. Uh, they have this free sample where you can take a look at it. It's called Asset Transfer. And essentially, it's uh, between a seller and a buyer, an inspector and an appraiser. And it takes this whole, I'm, I'm transferring this asset. What's the asset? It's a house. So it has this codified real estate business logic involved between all these different actors where there's an actor of a seller, a buyer, an inspector, appraiser, right? These are the, the generic actors of this business network, if you will, this consortium where every participant of this blockchain network is represented by a different person right here. So again, it's just important just to note that a smart contract is essentially codified business logic. Something else that you're going to hear within the uh, within the Ethereum terminology, if you will. So you're going to hear nodes and peers and virtual machines, right? So a node, a peer, is essentially different computers that are on the network that are running the Ethereum node. They have the exact copy of the blockchain that you have. So, um, you know, just to show you that when you launch this Ethereum private network consortium that I was showing you, here's a screenshot of what it would look like in your Azure environment. And, and I highlighted these two virtual machines. Essentially, these two virtual machines where you see here Reg1 and Reg10 and Reg11, those are different nodes. And anything that I do within this blockchain network, these two peers, these two nodes, 
they have a copy of all the transactions that happen. So you could see now if we have say, you know, four different nodes, we'll have four different virtual machines, so on and so forth. So uh, just like you have nodes, you also have a consensus algorithm. And just simply put that the, that the consensus algorithm is the agreement among all nodes in the network about the current state of the Ethereum network. And out of the box, Microsoft provides two different solution templates. You have an Ethereum proof of work consortium or Ethereum proof of authority consortium. Now we're not gonna get into what these particular, um, what these particular consensus algorithms mean, like the proof of work and the proof of authority. Uh, I'll just make one mention is that right now there's proof of work in the public Ethereum network. Uh, soon we're hearing that uh, the upgrade should be coming soon for public Ethereum. They should be moving over to proof of stake. We don't see that right now in the Azure marketplace and we don't see that in the, in, in the uh, production mainnet what is the uh, is the public ethereum network that we we're talking about uh, but we do have also in this uh, private blockchain consortium we do have proof of authority coming out of the box so i think it's important to note that there's different consensus algorithms that offer unique benefits and again we cover all that in our half day uh in our half day immersion so uh, we definitely would like to get into that at another point in time Hashing is interesting because hashing is essentially where you have this crypt cryptographic function which takes an input and returns a fixed size alphanumeric string, which is called the hash value. It's like the digital fingerprint. You see, I just put a message into there, just my name, Daniel Norkin, and the date. You see, it ends in BA2C. If I change just one letter of that message or one number to 17, you see it changes to F0317. And you can see that if I go back and change it to 18, there it is BA2C. And you could just keep on adding new information and it'll keep changing the different string. This is just interesting when, when, when we talk about hashing and we talk about privacy and encryption and uh, you know that you can take the entire message and put that into one string hash. And that's essentially what your fingerprint is. And there's different ways that we can do this. We could do this on the blockchain within the smart contracts. We could do this off the blockchain, but essentially it's important to know when, you know, if there's any takeaway from this is what is a hash? A hash is a combination of different uh, letters and characters that all goes into a fixed alphanumeric string that we see right there in the bottom. So blockchain validation. Blockchain validation is something that you're gonna hear. And this is where you're gonna check the coherence of the cryptographic signature of the block with the history stored in the entire blockchain. So if you're performing block validation, if your node, now that we know what a node is, right? If your node is providing this block validation, you're checking, at, you're probably at block three, for example, checking the, the validity of the data with number one or number two. And then also, so then you also have to do the rest and you're checking block two and then you're checking block one. And that's what we're getting into when we're talking about the Merkle tree and we're talking about block validation. So again, it's being able to, to check the signature of the previous blocks in the entire blockchain. So, so that was essentially, um, you know, just some, just some key terms, key terminology, which you would hear with Ethereum. So now we're talking about Hyperledger Fabric. And Hyperledger Fabric is really interesting, came around the same time as Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric also is an open source enterprise grade permissioned distributed ledger technology DLT platform. It's designed for use in enterprise contexts that delivers some key differentiating capabilities over other popular distributed ledgers or blockchain platforms. Um, so we're going to see similar uh, we're going to see similarities over the next couple slides. Um, so one important thing to mention is that it is a permissioned distributed ledger technology. So 
when we're talking about um, the public Ethereum and the cryptocurrency that's needed in order to transact on that. And anyone can go ahead and purchase that, uh, uh, purchase the Ethereum and they can go and download the wallet. Now they have access to the entire network. Well, it's a little bit different. Hyperledger Fabric does not allow that. It is strictly made for enterprise grade solutions. It is strictly made for permissioned blockchains. So uh, let's just see what we, let's just talk about what we see right here. So here's a screenshot of a block. So here's a, uh, here's on the Hyperledger Fabric Explorer. Again, the Explorer is just a web UI for you to kind of take a look into the blockchain and see what's happening. So within the Hyperledger Fabric Read the Docs, one of the terms that you're going to see is you're going to see block. So block contains some, some important details like block number, block hash. We spoke about hash before. You see that these terminologies now are starting to come up in different frameworks. And that's important. That's what we're trying to get at, that now that we spoke about this, you know, a hash and a block in, in another framework earlier in the presentation with Ethereum, now we can take that knowledge and apply it to another framework. Uh, one important thing to note is that you're going to see in the block details, you have a channel name that wasn't part of Ethereum. That's one of the benefits that Hyperledger has. We're going to showcase that over the next couple slides. So another terminology that you see is chain, just like blockchain, right, that we talked about in Ethereum. And again, you can very easily see in this explorer that I'm scrolling down in this, in this, uh, this mini screen capture showing you that Every single block is tied into the previous block and you can look into different blocks within the blockchain. So what we see right here is chain code. Chain code is another terminology that you'll find within Hyperledger Fabric. And chain code is a smart contract. It's, it's the name for a smart contract within the Hyperledger Fabric uh, um, network. And uh, we spoke about what smart contracts are earlier in this presentation with, uh, with Ethereum. And essentially, it's the same thing. It allows you to create this business logic codified program where you can use that to make transactions across the network. And if we take a look at line 64 to 67, you could see right here that that the smart contract has to deal in the automobile industry. As you can see that there's certain areas where you would have to input information around the car make, the car model, the color, and the owner. So channels, like I told you earlier, is something that's uh, very important within the Hyperledger Fabric um, network. And this is something that Ethereum doesn't have. So I'm going to point a little, uh, I'm going to put some attention onto this particular uh, screenshot. So essentially, if we're talking about the Hyperledger Fabric Network, we could say that we have three participants within a network. We have Business A, Business B, and Business C. What a channel allows you to have is a way to interact on the blockchain without having everybody see every single action. So in the Ethereum network, it was, uh, it, it was a way for this consortium, this, these businesses to operate, but everyone within the network sees every transaction. In Hyperledger Fabric, you transact in such a way with the use of channels that now you have this element of privacy. So the channel is a private blockchain overlay, which allows for data isolation and confidentiality. Um, and, and again, if you have this channel and business C is transacting something to business B, if they're transferring an asset or, or some other transactions happening and business A doesn't see this happening. And this is really important when we talk about how do we use blockchain uh, for many different businesses to share a ledger without everybody seeing all the information if that's what your use case is calling for. That's why it's important to take note in what a channel is with regards to blockchain technology. 
So here's something a little bit different, right? Just in the way that it's being presented. So we're talking about um, ledgers, right? And, and hyperledger fabric, the ledger consists of two different parts, two very different distinct parts. So we have the blockchain and we have the state database, which is also known as the world state. And unlike other ledgers, blockchains are immutable. That is, once a block has been added to the chain, it cannot change. Um, so, so this is just this is just important to note that this ledger and hyperledger fabric is composed of these two parts: a blockchain and a state database, which is also the world state. Something also that you'll talk about when you're talking about the hyperledger fabric. Uh, project, you're talking about ordering services and peers. And an ordering service is a defined collection of nodes that orders transactions into a block. Um, and a peer is a network entity that maintains a ledger and runs the chain code containers in order to perform the read-write operations of the ledger. So again, it's just important to note that as certain transactions happen, they're being sent to the ordering service. The ordering service then performs the consensus algorithm. It then delivers the, uh, and then delivers in a batch over to the peer, which is then written in the blockchain ledger. Again, the peer contains information of the blockchain ledger and then is distributed to all the different peers that are in, in the network. And we're talking about private data. Again, confidential data is stored in a private database on each authorized peer, like we just were talking about peers. And this is one benefit that the Hyperledger Fabric project has that, for example, the one we spoke about earlier, Ethereum, doesn't have this sort of privacy layer, if you will, uh, built, into, built into the network. So um, access, to this data is restricted to one or more organizations on a channel via private data collection. So again, this is just important to note without getting too deep into this, why it is that uh, you know, certain, certain use cases will require, uh, based on privacy needs, one blockchain framework over another. So let's just talk about standards for, for just a second. We spoke a lot about terminology and let's just talk about standards. So there's an organization group, nonprofit called the EEA, which is the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. And it's a member led industry organization. They have over 500 organizations as members uh, whose objective is to drive the use of Ethereum blockchain technology as an open source to empower all enterprises. Um, they have basically four key values. They want to build an open source standard specification. They want to address enterprise requirements. They evolve alongside the public Ethereum blockchain and they strive for interoperability. Uh, the reason why I'm really bringing this up right here, I mean, yes, we are members and yes, we do attend some of the working group meetings, um, but it's important to know because the two frameworks I spoke about they're working together in standardizing the way that blockchain is being discussed and utilized. So back on October 1st of 2018, just two months ago, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and the Hyperledger, uh, they, they uh, decided that they're going to work together on this global blockchain business ecosystem. So uh, the Hyperledger um, Hyperledger organization just joined the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. And, uh, you know, again, the more, the more organizations that work together, the more standards that happen. But with regards to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a working document that, that they're working on right now. So there's the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, Client Specification Version 2. Uh, this is the second iteration of, of this document and the open standards-based framework 
incorporates technical contributions from the EEA's expansive member base, uh, encompassing a vibrant global enterprise and developer community. And this is coming from the Technical Specifications Working Group. Um, so they, they, they have this very, very robust document. Again, this is version two of it. Um, and in one section they talk about that I just wanted to highlight for just a second. They talk about this enterprise Ethereum architecture stack. And this stack offers businesses and developers uh, better visibility into enterprise connections between business processes and the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, the diagram below reveals how each application relates to the, the technology resources. Uh, this is going to give you a multi-layered view that I'm going to go screen by screen across the different applications and tools and technologies and it defines how groups and vendors, developers, really the entire ecosystem is able to take advantage of this enterprise Ethereum specification. Um, it is important that I show you this. We're just going to go quickly. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but again, some of the, some of the uh, points that we're going to talk about over here, uh, this is something that you're going to see across many different blockchain networks. So the way to read this is you have your legend over here in the bottom. Uh, what's in green is designed for the public Ethereum right, the public network. And what you see over here in the purple, this is designed for the enterprise Ethereum. So at the very level, we have the networking protocol, right? We have it on the public Ethereum and enterprise Ethereum. And the next layer up, we typically see, this is where we see the core blockchain. This is where you see your storage, your ledger. This is where you have the execution environments and this is where you have your consensus algorithms. At the next level up is where you have your privacy and your scaling. This is where you decide what happens on chain, what happens off chain. At the next level up, this is where you have your tooling as they call it. This is where you have your permissions along with the wallets and the key management. You have your integration libraries, you have your APIs, you have your client interfaces. The, the, the RPC endpoint is essentially how you make these integration calls. And at the very top layer, you have the applications. You have these dApps that we were talking about before. You have the contracts and standards with regards to identity and resource breakdowns, um, you know, and you have smart contract languages, et cetera. So again, um, you can go ahead and take a look at this enterprise Ethereum architecture stack in a little bit more uh, depth, if you will, in this uh, client specification V2. You can either go to the enterprise Ethereum Alliance and download it for free there, or you can go to our website at www.envisionblockchain.com backslash downloads. Again, it's a free download as well. So what's next? Again, depending on where you are in your, you know, organizational journey, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you may want to take advantage of one of our Microsoft Azure Marketplace service offerings. Again, you could just go to envisionblockchain.com backslash Microsoft dash Azure dash marketplace dash offers. Uh, or of course, you'd be able to find it through one of the tabs out there. And, uh, you know, just, just to go over a couple of these, we have the Enterprise Blockchain Immersion. This is our half-day workshop. Uh, we also have an Enterprise Blockchain Discovery Day. It's essentially uh, a one-day assessment where at the very end of the day, you're going to be able to answer the question, do I need a blockchain? Is a centralized database better for you or is a decentralized database better for you? Is, a, is, a, is what you're doing better with other technology or is blockchain the right fit? We also offer the Enterprise Blockchain Accelerator, which is our four-day POC. This is where we kind of put all into one quick week a use case discussion, business process mapping, smart contract development. And again, we're gonna deploy this in the Microsoft Azure environment using their blockchain workbench as one of the uh, great accelerator tools that they provide.
And then we also have our enterprise blockchain deep dive. This is the five day assessment. This is where we, this is where we dive deep into the specific requirements of what your business is looking for. Uh, the output gives you both the functional and the technical requirements you can pay and take back to your team and understand exactly how to move forward. So again, I appreciate everybody from watching. Have yourself a very happy holidays and uh, we hope to catch you next year. Thank you so much. Bye.